Well, good morning. I'd like you to turn, please, to Galatians chapter 1. I'm going to read from verse 6 down to verse 16, and we're going to be thinking about an amazing defection, an amazing defection. I was thinking about calling it amazing disgrace rather than amazing grace because they're disentangling themselves from grace and going to law. Maybe that's a better title. I don't know. But anyway, verse 6, it says, I marvel that ye, ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Or do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. And God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this morning. Uh, one of the things we notice is that you don't get the usual uh, thanksgiving uh, or uh, greetings in any kind of way or even prayer. Uh, for the Christians, which is quite common in Paul's epistles. But what we find is immediately there's this amazement followed by a warning and a pronouncement of judgment. And so it just tells you how serious this all is viewed by the Apostle Paul. And of course, it's the warning is against those who would endeavor to change the gospel and pollute the pure stream of grace. I want you to notice, too, how central Christ is to Paul's gospel. He speaks uh, in verse 6 about the grace of Christ. I marvel you are soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. Verse uh, to, Into another gospel. Verse 7, he talks about the gospel of Christ. And he says, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And then the final reference in verse 10 is to the servant of Christ. He says, I do not persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. And what you can see is that everything is so Christocentric. The gospel of Christ, the grace of Christ, the servant of Christ. And they're trying to pull people away from this gospel that so magnifies the person of Christ to this other gospel. And so Paul is so uh, zealously seeking to correct these false notions. And so it's the sole instance where St. Paul uh, admits to express his thanksgiving in addressing any church. So it's kind of unique. No thanksgiving given at all. Even the Corinthians, with all their problems, he thanked God that they came behind in no gift. But when it comes to the Galatians, no thanksgiving whatsoever. So in verse 6 and 7, we want to think, first of all, about the perversion of the gospel. And the censure in verse 6 is primarily to the Galatian Christians themselves. And then in verse 7, it's to the false teachers. So in verse 6, he's dealing with the Galatians. In verse 7, he's dealing with the teachers who were influencing them. 
And so it tells in verse six that Paul was amazed. He was astonished. He was bewildered by the speed of their defection. I marvel, he says, that you are so soon removed. And so this this idea of the speed of it all just uh, really kind of uh, amazed him, uh, astonished him. How could they move away so quickly from the grace of Christ to this other gospel? And it's a tragic thing, isn't it, when um, people defect so quickly. They seem to be all in, and then the next minute they're kind of gone. They're out. And that's what he's bothered about. Now, the interesting thing is, and again, I'm not a Greek scholar, but the Greek scholars tell us the tense of the Greek uh, is they were removing themselves. It, it implies they were removing themselves. In other words, uh, they, they're being moved, but they're moving themselves. So in other words, they're culpable. They're responsible. Uh, yes, the false teachers are responsible for giving the error, but the Christians themselves are also responsible for swallowing it, for believing it, for defecting so quickly. They were transferring themselves from grace to law, from liberty to bondage. And so, yes, we would say false teachers are certainly culpable, but so are the people that follow them. That's why we're told we're, we're to be discerning, we're, uh, we're to be like the Bereans, we're to, to search the scriptures, see if these things are so. We're, we're responsible uh, to uh, be careful about truth. And so their defection was not only from the gospel of God, but it was from God himself. Notice again what he says, I marvel you're so, so soon removed, notice this, from him that called you. And so it's a moving away from God himself, uh, the one who called them, uh, one who spoke to them through the gospel message. And so they're, they're basically, uh, and this would have startled them because they thought they were honoring God by trying to keep his law. And what he says is to give up the pure gospel was to give up on God himself. It was to turn away from him who called you. And that would have really shocked them because, again, they always think, you know, if you're if you're zealous for the law, you kind of feel like, well, I'm doing this because of my, my faithfulness to God. And he said, no, actually, you've been unfaithful to God. You're, you're giving up on God who has called you unto this marvelous gospel. Again, we want to emphasize the stress on grace as well. I marvel that you're soon, so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ to another gospel. Everything that we have in our gospel comes to us because of the amazing grace of God. And uh, again, we, we know grace. It's, it's a wonderful word, the idea of unmerited, undeserved favor. Uh, and it's it's incredible. We, we should never get over the idea of God's undeserved, unmerited favor. And so their calling didn't res, uh, rest on their fulfillment of the law, but in the grace of Christ. How did he call you? To the grace of Christ. It was to a message of grace that they were called to. And again, we, we have to think about a little bit, just for a moment, about grace. And of course, these are very familiar scriptures. I want to go to Ephesians chapter 2. And um, just kind of remind ourselves of the truth of grace. Ephesians 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace are ye saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And why grace is so important is because if people could be saved, on the basis of works, when we got to heaven, it would be a miserable place because everybody there would be boasting about all the things that they did in order to get there. Oh, let me tell you about what a wonderful person I was. And, and after a while, we'd be thinking, I don't want to be around these people because all they're doing is talking about themselves. But when we get to glory, what we're going to be talking about? We're going to be saying, I don't deserve to be here. I'm only here 
because of Christ, because of his amazing grace, that he loved me and gave himself for me. And so the idea is this, that all the boasting in heaven will be in the lamb that was slain. It'll be on the Lord Jesus. It won't be about us. It'll all be about him. And that's why grace is so marvelous, so wonderful. Look at Acts 13, please. Acts 13, just again, thinking about this marvelous subject of grace. Acts 13 and verse 38 and 39, we read these words. Be it known unto you, brethren, uh, uh, unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believed uh, are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. You see, it's all through this man. Uh, it would be impossible for us to be justified by the law of Moses because we can't keep it. But it's all because of this man that we've received forgiveness of sin. So the grace of God certainly is a key theme in this letter. Uh, we see it repeated over and over again. We see it in, in uh, chapter 1, verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We see it here in verse 6. A marvel you're soon removed from the, him that called you to the grace of Christ to another gospel. Uh, we see it in verse 15 of the same uh, chapter, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Uh, we see it again in chapter 2 and verse 9. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen, they unto the circumcision and we see again in verse 21 he says i do not frustrate the grace of god for if righteousness come by the law then christ is dead in vain uh, we see it in chapter 5 again and verse 4 it says christ has become of no effect unto you whosoever of you are justified by the law you are fallen from grace and then chapter 6 verse 18 it ends with these words, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And truly, we would say, I hope all of us to a, to a man or every person here would say this, grace, tis a charming sound, melodious to the ear. It's wonderful. Uh, the amazing grace, wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How can my tongue describe it? Where does its praise begin? And so grace is an amazing thing. And so Paul is is talking again about uh, marveling that they're soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ, unto this another gospel. And now he wants to talk about the censure of the false teachers. And I want you to notice uh, just the term here, another gospel, then he says, which is not another. And so uh, kind of spanning verse 6 and the end of verse 6 and into verse 7. Now, again, the Greek language uh, has two distinct words uh, that are translated in, in our English Bible as another. And so they're, they're, in Greek, it's more specific. So there's, there's one word that means another of the same kind, and that's the word alos, and then there's another Greek word, which means another of a different kind, which is heteros. And so when we talk about somebody being heterosexual, it means that they're married to somebody of a different kind, right? A man and a woman, right? That's the idea of heterosexual, a heteros, uh, another of a different kind. And so as we, we look at uh, verse 6 and 7, what we see Paul is saying this. He says, unto another gospel, in verse 6, so it says, uh, the grace of Christ unto another gospel, and that word is heteros, another gospel of a different kind. So they're moving you away from the grace of Christ into another gospel of a different kind, which is not another. The word another here in verse 7 is another of the same kind. It's not another of the same kind. It's another of a different kind. So it's really spelling it out. It would be very clear to them. They're moving away to another gospel of a different kind, which is not another of the same kind of the one that they first heard 
preached from the Apostle Paul. So the false teachers propagated a gospel that was diametrically opposed to the gospel of God's grace. It was a different kind of gospel uh, and, and totally different. And the result of this different kind of gospel is this. It says uh, in verse 7, which is not another, there's some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. The word trouble means agitate, disturb, or confuse. And, you know, false teaching and false gospels always agitate, disturb, or confuse the people of God. And that's what's happening. Uh, it's causing them to be agitated, to be disturbed, to be confused. Um, and so what is this uh, that's de causing them to desert and embrace a perverted gospel because he goes on and he says uh there's, there's another that which is not another but there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of christ what is this message that is troubling them so much causing the church to be in a state of perplexity excitement turmoil doubt mental confusion because false teachers were seeking to pervert or change the gospel. To pervert is to change something into something completely the opposite or completely of the opposite nature. A pervert is somebody who is doing things that are not natural. It's, 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 it's different and it's not healthy. It's not good. And so perverting the gospel, changing it into something completely the opposite nature. There's a there's a beautiful um, line of a of a hymn. I've never heard the hymn sung, uh, but this is how it goes. And and I just want to read it because I think it's it just kind of highlights the beauty of the gospel that they were abandoning. Abandoning. It says this: God tells me how I may be saved. He points to something done, accomplished on Mount Calvary by His beloved Son in which no works of mine have place, for grace with works is no more grace. Now, I just let me just read that one more time because it's worth reading. I think it's wonderful. God tells me how I may be saved. He points to something done, accomplished on Mount Calvary by his beloved Son, in which no works of mine have place, for grace with works is no more grace. And this, another gospel that was being presented, was taking away from the grace that is in, based on the, the finished work of Christ, and it's putting the emphasis on the Galatians to work, to seek to keep the law, to seek to do things. And in that sense, it was a completely different gospel. And of course, the, the gravity of preaching this other gospel is seen in verses 8 through 10. It's made very clear. It says in verse 8, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And of course, he repeats it again for emphasis um, in verse 9. Uh, and we said before, so I'll say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that you have received, let him be accursed. And it's almost like the Paul, Paul is saying, uh, I want you to get this. Don't miss this. That anybody that preaches or believes another gospel other than the one that I preached, they're putting themselves under a divine anathema, a curse. Uh, a curse from God. So it's this is how serious this whole thing is. And that's why he repeats it twice, in case you might have uh, kind of not caught it the first time. He wants you to get this. A curse is due to anyone who rejects, perverts, or falsifies the gospel of his son. Now, that's very strong language, isn't it? The, the, how important is the gospel? Well, it's so important that if you reject it, you're putting yourself under a curse. Cursed is everyone who keeps not everything that's written in the law of Moses, right? You're putting yourself under a curse. Uh, you're uh, rejecting it, perverting it, uh, falsifying the gospel of his son. It puts you under a divine curse. Now, in verse 8, 
Paul is stating a hypothetical situation. His references to an angel from heaven uh, would confirm this, that it's hypothetical. But in verse 8, uh, he's, uh, sorry, verse 9, he's dealing with an actual situation, the actual position. Uh, because if any man preach any other gospel, and some men were preaching this another gospel, but he begins with an angel. What he's saying is this, the original preaching which they had heard and received must never be altered. God's word cannot be amended. Paul is condemning the whole system of Judaizing. It's all condemned, every part of it. There's no good bits in it. The whole thing is condemned. Uh, additions so-called to the gospel actually devalue the work of the Lord Jesus at Calvary and are to be utterly condemned. Now, I want you just to think about this. An angel from heaven preach any other gospel. I want you to look at an incident in the Old Testament that I think will really help us to see how important this is of uh, not changing what we've heard from God to a message that we might have heard from an angel. So look at 1 Kings 13, and this is the story of the old prophet. And um, I I, I, I'm going to just read verse 8, although you know the story fairly well, I'm sure. But in verse 8, uh, sorry, verse 18, it says this, He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art, and an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee unto thine house, that they may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. So I don't know if you know the, remember the story, but but here's a man. He's a, a prophet that is sent to Samaria. He, he's sent to uh, to to condemn uh, the worship uh, that had been set up by uh, by. Uh, I always get confused at Jeroboam or Rehoboam, uh, but basically to condemn the false altar. And he's told to go give his message and go back to Jude and not stop. Right? Don't stay. Give your message. You go back. And this old prophet <laughs> comes to him and he said, oh, I, I've also got a message from the Lord, from an angel of God <laughs> who gave me the word of the Lord. And he said, you're to come and have supper with me. And so he believed this second message that was supposedly given by an angel of God. And how did it work out for him? It didn't work out so well, right? He got eaten by a lion on his way <laughs> back. And so what we could say is this. Uh, the angel countermanded the original instructions given to the man of God. The man of God believed the old prophet with disastrous consequences. And there are awful consequences to those who were deceived by somebody uh, pretending to be an angel or saying that he's an angel and giving a message contrary to the message of the grace message that was given through the Lord Jesus. And again, I can't read this without thinking about those people who are caught up in Mormonism. What message did they get from an angel called Moroni that interpreted the golden plate supposedly that joseph smith found and so all of these people they're they've bought into a false gospel which is not another and how did they do it because an angel countermanded the message that had come directly from god himself and so there, there are terrible consequences for doing this now again there's something also interesting going on here because um the angel message. But remember the law that was given by Moses came in the hands of a mediator. And that mediator was angelic. And so if you look at chapter 4 of verse 19, Galatians 4, 19, now you wouldn't, just, just a casual reading of the giving of the law on Mount Sinai back in the book of Exodus, you wouldn't pick this up. But the New Testament tells us in Galatians um, chapter 4, and it's not verse 19, um, verse 9. 
Hmm. Okay. Somebody stole it. I thought pretty sure it said in here that an angel had given the message. Okay, let's look at one of the references. Somebody might find the one in Galatians I'm thinking of. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 2. To, again, to show that the law is given through the mediation of angels. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just rec recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation that was uh, spoken by the Lord and was con confirmed to us by those that heard him? Galatians 3 and 19, Mike. All right, yes. Galatians 3 19. Thank you. Galatians 3 19. Wherefore then serveth the law, it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. And so what we're seeing here is this, the law uh, came through the mediation of angels to them. But Paul is saying the gospel came directly from Christ himself. And therefore, if an angel preaches any other message, then, and of, of course, a law message even, just as the original angelic media has brought a law message, any other gospel than what you have uh, we've preached unto you, let him be accursed. So now verse 9, it says, As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that you have received, let him be accursed. So now we're getting down to not so much angels, but a man. And of course, that's what's happened in Galatia. Some individual has come in bringing this law message. And what, what is the result for this man? Well, he's putting himself under a curse. He's preaching another gospel, which is not another. And so uh, it's, it's a man. And of course, uh, he's, he, again, he's putting himself under a divine anathema. And of course, uh, what he's doing, he's loving the law more than he's loving the Lord Jesus and his message of grace. And again, verse uh, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22 says this, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. Let him be cursed. Let him be put under a curse. <clears throat> so what we could say is this. Christ supplemented is Christ supplanted. If you try to add anything to the finished work of Christ, you're actually taking away the place that Christ is to have in the centrality of the gospel. Woe to anyone who would tamper with the gospel. Those who are uh, perverting the gospel were claiming authority because they came from Jerusalem. The mother church, uh, because that's where the Judaizers pretty much came from, and we're possibly using the name of James without his permission. But Paul has stated here that his gospel was received from God the Father and from Christ personally, so that every other message must be false and would bring the preachers under the judgment of God. <clears throat> the credentials of these men must not mislead the saints in any way. Notice the gospel which he preached in verse 8. He says, Though we are an angel in heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached unto you. And then verse 9, it's the gospel that they received. He says, as we said before, and say now again, any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received. So he's going back to the time when he came into Galatia. He preached the gospel, and they received that gospel. And now... They so quickly have been moved away to this other gospel, which is not another, which has been brought into them by false teachers who are putting themselves under a curse because of their false message. Verse 10, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. What Paul is saying is this, that all of his, his um, 
persecutions, all of his difficulties have come from those that hold to the law message. And so he's telling us that uh, if I was interested in pleasing men, I, I wouldn't suffer like I am. Uh, do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? If I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. I'm not a, a man pleaser. Uh, maybe his enemies accused him of changing the message to suit his audience, something like that. But he's insisting there's only one gospel, and I'm not trying to be a man pleaser in any way. I'm simply seeking to please God who has given me this gospel to preach. If Paul... Uh, changed his message to suit men, he says, I would not be the servant of Christ. In fact, he would be inviting upon himself the wrath of God to fall upon him. Paul, of course, did not seek to persuade men, but he did seek, uh, sorry, he, he did seek to persuade men, but he did not seek men's approval. He wasn't a man pleaser. And one of the things that we've got to learn, and, and it's, it's a, a challenging thing, but there's always this tendency to want to be liked and to want to please men. But we must remember that we are first and foremost servants of Christ, and we must seek always to please him. And beware of the snare of pleasing men. God's message is offensive to men. Because it's so offensive to men because what it says to men is that, the, that you can have no part in the salvation process, that it's a, a work of Christ, that he did it all. There's nothing you can add to it. And so it's displeasing to men. They want to do something. And so this message is basically saying there's, there's nothing you can do to save yourself. It's all been done. It's a finished work. And all you have to do is depend on that person who did that work. And so uh, it, it's, it's not pleasing to men. And Paul says, I'm, I'm not interested in, in pleasing men. I'm interested in being a servant of Christ. And so we need to just learn from that. It's very, very significant, very important. So Paul is now moving from verse 11 uh, down to 24, and he's going to talk about how he got his gospel. We've thought about how he got his apostleship early on, again, that it was given to him not by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. It was a divinely given apostleship. And now he wants to show that actually the gospel that he preached did not come from men either. It was a divinely given message. And so verse 11 and 12 is emphasizing the, that divinely communicated message. In verse 11, it was divine in its character. So he says, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Now, when he says, I certify you, uh, that word certify you that's translated, the word certify you is also translated as I declare unto you in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1. And there's kind of a bit of a play on words here in verse 11. He says, uh, the, the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. And the word preached here is the word evangelisco. So it's, it's like saying this, the gospel that I gospel to you is not after man. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, by the way, notice how touching this is, that he, that he does still call them brethren. I certify you brethren. He addresses them as brethren. They're deceived disturbed and defecting in their duty to Christ, but they're still regarded as brethren, deeply in need of spirit-inspired counsel, but he still recognizes their brethren. But they're being led astray, and he wants to recover them. He wants to bring them back, and so he still calls them brethren. And he wants them to know that his preaching was divine in origin. It was not after man. It emanates from the Godhead. It's completely divine in every respect. In contrast to the different gospel brought by others, Paul's message was a revelation from God. It was not man's attempt to reach up and, and understand God. It was God's design to come down and communicate with men his message. It was not a human gospel. 
No man would ever devise a message which gave man no place and no credit. You see, if man was going to design a, a, a message, it would somehow he'd be the center of it and he would get the glory from it. But no man would come up with a message like this because man is not center stage. Christ is center stage. And so this is certainly uh, not a human gospel in any way. And so he tells us, uh, I'd certify you, brethren, the gospel was preached of me is not after man. Verse 12, for I neither received it of man. It was a divinely communicated to the apostle Paul. He says, I, I, re I, I have re neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, when we think of the law, Go back to Acts 22 with me for a minute, and we'll see how did Paul get his law teaching. He says in Acts chapter 22 and verse 3, he says, I am very verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, yet brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. So how did he get his message of the law? From Gamaliel. He was, he was taught by men. Uh, in fact, he received the law of the fathers, or the tradition of the fathers, basically, was handed down to Paul from uh, Gamaliel. But when it came to the gospel that he preached, there was no human instruction involved at all. No human instruction, no human interpretation in connection with the gospel. He received the message directly from the Lord Jesus. He did not receive it of man. No human agency was involved. It would ha was handed down to him, uh, not like the tradition of the fathers, but it was directly given to him uh, from the Lord. And of course, this is, again is, is hitting at these uh, Galatians because they were moving over to another message that gloried in the tradition of men and the tradition of the fathers. But Paul is saying, no, this message that I got, it came directly from the Lord himself. And so he says, I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of of Jesus Christ. And so we can see a parallel actually between both his apostleship and the gospel he preached. It tells us here in verse 11 that it was not after man. What about his apostleship back in verse 1? Paul an apostle not of man. So so clearly it not was not of man. It was directly from the Lord himself. Uh, then he says in verse 12, I neither received it of man. What about his apostleship? Again, verse 1, not of men, neither by man. And so again, just the, the parallel there is, is clear. And then, so where did he get it from? Well, when it comes to his gospel, it was by the revelation of Jesus Christ in verse 12. When it came to his apostleship, it's not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So both his apostleship and his gospel is received directly from God. I mean, what, what an amazing thing. Now, for us, it's a different story. We became acquainted with the gospel through reading scripture or listening to preaching or maybe somebody uh, witnessing to us. But Paul got it directly from heaven itself. And I think that's the thing that we need to recognize. He was unique, uh, very unique. This is unique that he received it that way. For the rest of us, it's usually through preaching. Look at Romans chapter 10. Uh, we'll see it clearly there that, uh, that the message that m most of us have responded to is a message that has been preached to us. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 and 15. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and preach, uh, bring glad tidings of good things. So all of us, usually it was a gospel preacher. Somewhere along the way, a gospel preacher or somebody who witnessed to us or maybe just reading the scriptures. But, but we there was some mediation, some other agency involved 
But when it came to Paul, uh, he was not normal in this respect. He got his gospel in a very dramatic, very direct revelation when he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. However, what we would say is that uh, even though we didn't get ours by direct revelation, we did get it from the word of God, which is a revelation from God. And what we need to make sure is that our convictions and doctrine are based on divine revelation, never by human opinion, never by the traditions of man, always everything we believe, it must be based on the revelation of scripture. And so all of our convictions must come from there. We were uh, involved in a little bit of a discussion uh, last night at someone's home, and we were talking about uh, the different views of Genesis chapter 1. And one of the things we said is that uh, if you were just reading the text of Scripture, nothing else, you would simply accept that God created the heavens and earth in six 24-hour days. You would never see it any differently. The evening and the morning were the first day, even the very giving of the Christian or, or the Sabbath for the Jews. Six days God made the heaven and the earth on the seventh day rested, and therefore there to rest on the Sabbath. Like just plain reading of the text, you'd never you'd never come up with any other conclusion. And yet, amazingly, people come up with big different conclusions that it speaks of ages and all. Where do they get that from? It's not from the text. They're trying to harmonize the text with science falsely so called and again plain reading of the you'd never dream that stuff up ever and so again our convictions where must they come from divine revelation not traditions not science falsely so called uh, and that would include psycho psychology all those other things it we must get our convictions from the word of god and stand on it uh, I love the words of Luther. Here I stand, I can do no other. God help me. But Paul got his gospel directly by a revelation from the risen, glorified head of the church, the Lord Jesus. And so he's then is called as a divinely commissioned messenger in verse 13 through 24. So notice in verse 13, he says, for you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion and how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and I wasted it. So first of all, uh, what we're going to do is we're looking at Paul's spiritual history in this section. He's kind of giving us a recount of his spiritual history. And what he's showing and establishing here is that Rather than receiving the truths of the gospel from the 12, making him a second-hand apostle, he received them directly from the Lord Jesus. So in the process of this, he's kind of giving his, his history, but the whole point of it is to show that he got it directly. He didn't get it second-hand, even from the, the regular apostles. He received it directly from the Lord. So in verse 13 and 14, we, we see his conduct in the past, prior to conversion. What, what happened to him prior to his salvation. So verse 13 and 14, we see uh, particularly his persecution of the church. Two things that marked his life before his conversion was his hatred of the Christians in verse 13 and his fanatical zeal as a Jew in verse 14. So this is kind of a, a summary of his past life. What was he like? Well, he hated Christians. <laughs> and secondly, he, he had a tremendous zeal as a Jew. So verse 13, he, he, he says, For you have heard of my conversation, my manner of life in time past in the Jews' religion. And notice this phrase, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God. That word beyond measure it's highlighting the excessiveness of his zeal in persecuting the church. He went he went above and beyond in his zeal to persecute the church. And, and what did he do? He says he wasted it. It literally, uh, that word wasted, very interesting word. It means he, he sought to overthrow it, to destroy it, to make havoc with it, to lay waste. 
uh, something you know you get the picture of a battlefield and all these uh, these corpses laid waste and the idea was that he sought to completely waste the church of god to, to that's that was his ideal to see to see like a battlefield and to see all these corpses of these people that he considered to be such heretics laying on the battlefield he sought to overthrow destroy make havoc lay waste he was the supreme Judaistic fanatic of his generation. Nobody exceeded his zeal for persecuting Christians. And then verse 14, again, uses some interesting words, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of the fathers. This word profited, it has the idea to cut forward or blaze a trail. And the idea is this, that Paul is pushing forward, advancing in the Jewish religion, and he's outstripping all the others. Uh, like he's he's way ahead of all his contemporaries. They, they're all kind of feel like they're serving the Lord, but but he's cutting this trail. He's blazing the trail, outstripping everyone. He started out with his fellow classmates, but he soon left them standing, uh, standing in the dust. He says uh, that that he, um, he not only beyond measure persecuted the church, but but he he he's, he profited in the Jews' religion above many mine equals of mine own nation. And notice this: being more exceedingly zealous for the tradition of the fathers. So much of the conflict that the Lord Jesus experienced when he was on this earth was against the traditions of the Pharisees, the traditions of the fathers. That was where the conflict was, right? Uh, they they uh, valued the traditions. In fact, they made the word of God of no effect by their traditions. They so elevated tradition that truth was lost in the in the midst of it all and so paul was a pharisee of the pharisees right so he's caught up in the traditions of his fathers and he's he's way ahead of everybody else in this regard and and so he became the ultimate pharisee of his generation the ultimate persecutor the ultimate pharisee of his generation i've been uh enjoying watching some uh, documentaries on YouTube about both John Wycliffe and William Tyndale. And what what is so clear when you, you see the accounts of these men's lives is that they were battling the same thing, the traditions of the fathers. And so Tyndale is burned at the stake after being strangled, and he's accused of being a heretic. What was his crime? His crime was he wanted to translate the Bible from the Greek New Testament into English. And that was considered heresy. Why? Because it would undermine the tradition that they held. And so he was killed. It's amazing how tradition just grips people. And so... Here's this, this zeal that he has for religion, his great enmity the Christ, to the Christian faith. He recognized they were incompatible. The Christian faith and the traditions of the Father just couldn't get along. Uh, he could see that. They were enmity. Even in his unconverted days, Paul realized that law and grace could not be mixed. He stood for a gospel of works and was completely opposed to the gospel of grace, which set aside all works as a means of salvation. He was caught up with the traditions of men. But God intervened very directly. And so here he is, more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. And then he says, but, <laughs> that lovely contrast word, when it pleased God, by the way, isn't it amazing that it would please God? to save this man who was such an enemy of the gospel. It pleased God. It brought pleasure to God. 
And then it says, and, and again, this, this would be a shocking statement, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. What, what Paul is telling us here is that his conversion was unique in that man had no part in it. It was supernatural work of God. No preacher is involved. And um, we've said before that no doubt there were people praying for him, his own kinsmen, maybe those that were being persecuted. But in terms of his conversion experience, it was clearly a work of God. And so God had a plan for Paul's life even before he was born. Isn't that amazing? Uh, it says that uh, he, he, he pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb. So before he actually was physically born into this world, God had already set him apart. He said he was a chosen vessel. And again, we've got to recognize, and I'm going to say this quite clearly, because sometimes people abuse this kind of teaching. Paul and Abraham were clearly the subjects of sovereign election. But their election was not with the thought of exclusion, but with the thought of inclusion. So when God calls Abraham, for what purpose? That through him, all the nations of the world would be blessed. It's not I'm picking Abraham so that I can damn everybody else. That's not the thought in God's mind at all. I'm, I'm going to reveal myself to this man so that through him, all the nations will be blessed. What about the Apostle Paul? Why did God do this for him? That he might preach my name before kings and rulers and the Gentiles, right? Is it with a thought of exclusion or is it with a thought of inclusion, God is going to use this man to bring multitudes to Christ. And so, again, it's not this idea of picking somebody out so that everybody else can be damned. It has this, this wonderful thought of, uh, of spreading, getting the message out so that more people can come to know the true and living God. And so God had a plan for Paul's life. Even before he's born, he's a chosen vessel. Uh, again, he, he's uh, going to bring blessing to many. And again, are we not reminded of another occasion like this? Uh, look, look at Jeremiah chapter 1. Here's somebody else who, before his mother's womb, or in his mother's womb, is chosen by God for a specific purpose and a specific ministry. Jeremiah 1 and verse 5. It says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Wow, oh, that amazing. Again, unto the nations. Interesting. He had a message for the nations. But God set him apart. And so, notice he says, that back in our verse here, it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb. I want to think about that word separated. It's an important word. The ancient Greek word aphorizo is related to the word used as a title for the religious elite in Paul's day. You know a name for the Pharisees in Paul's day? It was called the separated ones. That interesting. They, they thought they were the separated ones. The Pharisees. And Paul came to Jesus. He was he was an important Pharisee, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. But he wasn't really separated to God. He was separated to the traditions of his fathers. God is saying, before he got involved in all that stuff, I had already separated him from his mother's, mother's womb for the gospel. <laughs> and so... Uh, the calling by divine grace. He said he separated me from my mother's womb, called me by his grace, and that divine grace was uh, the incident on the Damascus Road, the encounter. And, of course, grace is a very appropriate term, isn't it? Please, God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. You see, 
it's not based on human merit, is it? What is Paul? He's a religious fanatic, zealous for the law. Certainly no human merit here in God calling him. It was entirely based on grace. And what's the purpose? To reveal his son in me, that I may preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Two purposes. He revealed his son to him in order to reveal his son in him. <laughs> and that's a, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? The revelation of the son to Paul is so that Christ would be revealed in Paul. And again, we think about our own conversion. Uh, what's, what's it all about? Why did Christ reveal himself to us in the scriptures? So that he might reveal himself through us to others, to be a blessing to others. And so he, he says that he revealed his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Again, this is no thought of exclusion. He wants him to preach. And what is his message? To preach him among the heathen. He's not preaching a formula. He's not preaching a package. He's preaching a person. Him, the Lord Jesus. We must preach Christ, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, but our time is gone. We'll have to deal with the rest of it next time. May God encourage us with God's heart for the world. Amen.